so good morning, everybody. This is a joint uh, committee meeting of House Appropriations and House Ways and Means on Wednesday, April 29th. Um, and I want to welcome everybody here. I think we have just about everybody from the two committees. Mm -hmm. And um, what we're going to do today is hear um, information about revenue from Tom Cavett. Um, I want to sort of set the stage that this is not a revenue forecast. This is um, maybe not even an update. It's Tom Kavett's um, uh, best information that he has at the moment to share with the two committees about what's happening with revenue. And it's not consensus with the administration. At some point, there will be a consensus forecast. And um, uh, Tom may want to talk a little bit about how that will unfold. Um, so uh, Kitty, I don't know if you have a few words you wanna to say to get us started. Um, uh, no, uh, I just wanna note, uh, Teresa or Sasha, will be, there, there's two handouts. Will they be shared on the screen at the same time? I will or be sharing, will be sharing the, sharing uh, okay. Sorsha, I'll share them on the screen. So if members aren't, were not able to print them off or don't have a second device to look at, we will have them on the screen. And as I mentioned earlier, if we could hold off on questions until the ends of certain sections, and uh, that way I think the information will, will, will roll out more smoothly and that we won't get bogged down on one section, but be able to get the, the entire overview from um, uh, Tom Cavett. If you would use your hand, you, we all know how to use our electronic hands. And I see Representative Hill, you have a question? Your hand is up. Not a question, just a request. Could people please mute themselves? I'm getting a lot of feedback already. And there are about five or six people who are not muted. Okay, thank you, George. And when you do have a question, don't forget to unmute yourself. Um, it, at least we see it a lot on the House floor or even in committee, people are, start to talk, but you gotta unmute yourself first. So Tom, welcome. And I think we should just jump in and, and get started. Um, we're happy to have you. Um, I wish the news would be happier than it is, but we, we can hear your latest thoughts on where we are. Yeah, great. Thank you very much, Kitty and Janet. Um, we've been doing revenue uh, uh, forecast for fiscal 20 since May, uh, since March 11th. And um, we flagged potentially 80 to $100 million in revenue vulnerability. Uh, back then and um, uh, it's, it's grown a little bit since then for FY20. And uh, we were asked to start framing FY21 order of magnitude kind of estimates uh, uh, a week or so ago. Uh, we'd been doing this jointly on a consensus basis and all of the FY20 data that are included in the documents that are handed out today are consensus. But FY21, as Janet mentioned, is not. So um, uh, I went ahead and did runs using all the same models that we use. We have uh, macroeconomic uh, assumptions from Moody's. Uh, we modified those slightly and, uh, and, and have done a run through all the categories. Um, there is phenomenal uncertainty right now, uh, which is, why there's good reason to be forecasting frequently and updating frequently as new information comes in. And the other thing is that it really important to remember is that this is not primarily an economic event. This is an epidemiological event with huge economic consequences. And uh, it's controlled by the epidemiology uh, and to, uh, uh, with, with secondary effects mostly uh, uh, in the form of federal offsets to try to uh, mitigate some of the health consequences of, uh, of this. So uh, we've been spending more time uh, looking at epidemiological models and what that might mean for both understanding how deep is the hole we're in now and what are the potential paths out that, that might be uh, reasonable to consider. Uh, there are four or five models that have state level estimates that we think are good. We've also been working with people in the administration, Mike Piacek, who 
who kind of has coordinated for the administration that information. And so we're all in sync with that and, and had an opportunity to talk with model developers of the epidemiological models. To a T, they will all tell you the quality of the inputs that they've had have been subaltern. They have not had, there's not been enough testing to populate the models in a way that provide really rigorous output. And that's why you've seen the models jump around quite a bit in terms of you know, what the peak dates might be, what the hospital resources might, needed might be, uh, you know, various things like that. Um, we've also been looking at other countries to try to get some idea of what paths out might look like. Um, and also early on what uh, problems with hospital healthcare utilization and the like we might be confronting. Um, so so that's, that's one set of issues and, and there's phenomenal uncertainty there. We couldn't get any of the epidemiological modelers to do projections longer than about eight weeks. So, you know, when we start talking about fiscal 21, we're beyond those models, but the considerations that are epidemiological are the most important ones, you know, saying, you know, to, to what extent, you know, will, will uh, uh, infections recede? Um, and as was mentioned before this started, uh, the state has been very successful in social distancing. Um, the metrics from Google and a couple other sources that we have show that there's very, been very high compliance in Vermont with that. And um, uh, as a result, you know, the, the stats today, any way you look at them are, are very, very good. Um, that's a good place to be starting from, but uh, looking at other countries and understanding what we know about the, the uh, uh, viral spread, there's, a, there's high risk in a resurgence at some point. And unlike some places like New Zealand that you know, basically are claiming they've eradicated it and they're an island and can control who's coming in and, and test people coming in and things like that, that's gonna be much, much harder uh, in any of the United States and particularly in Vermont um, where there is a lot of interstate commerce and some of the critical economic sectors that eventually we'd like to be starting up again will involve a lot of connection and commerce with surrounding states and urban areas which have had much higher uh, uh, infection rates. So um, uh, the, the epidemiological realities are what's driving this. The huge federal offsets are completely unprecedented. There's almost a $3 trillion that's been committed so far and probably another trillion or so uh, will, will still be forthcoming. At least we hope it'll be forthcoming because much of that would be targeted towards aid to state and local governments. And, uh, and that will be a, a dire need as these revenue numbers show. And, um, and as, as you've all been hearing from people in other states as well. So um, the, the way those funds flow though, uh, will be very important to measuring economic and revenue impacts. And it looks like to date, Whoops, okay, we've got screen sharing, sorry. Um, it looks like to date, uh, Vermont's been getting a disproportionate share of the, the federal monies. Um, our, our receipts from the Pay Tech Protection Program uh, have been uh, north of a billion dollars. Uh, that's substantially above our, uh, the state share of uh, uh, GDP relative to the nation. Um, but exactly how that money will be spent and when is, uh, is up in the air. Uh, just, just to give you an example, with the PPP program, one might have expected that a lot of the relief would have gone to things like restaurants and leisure and hospitality uh, businesses that have been very heavily impact, uh, impacted and uh, uh, have many small businesses that are 
uh, that comprise the sector. Uh, in, in fact, uh, the, the share that's gone to leisure and hospitality uh, is, is behind four other categories of business, including construction, professional and technical workers, um, uh, you know, and, and the, the monies that are received because businesses don't have to show harm, basically the money's flowing to lots and lots of small and not so small businesses, not necessarily those that need it most. So that gives a lot of potential capacity, but it won't necessarily rectify some of the layoffs that have, have occurred early on. And it also won't deal with longer lasting impacts unless there's a, a, a third and fourth and fifth version of the same thing. So um, there will be some sectors that see very long lasting impacts. Um, in addition to the epidemiological issues and the, and the federal offsets, there are also behavioral issues that will be really important. So how consumers react to some of these things will be important. There are levels of fear that can control uh, uh, act economic activity that uh, uh, could supersede any of the dollars that are handed out. So even if things open up, we've seen this in Georgia uh, just very recently where businesses were told they could reopen, but many of them didn't. And those that did, some had early rushes of customers and uh, then later uh, it's looked like a, you know, customers just aren't flocking back in. So I, I think that will be another issue, especially in uh, tourism related businesses. Um, there, there will be a reticence to, to just uh, coming right back. And it's not like, not like that will be a quick bounce back. Uh, so anyway, that, that's another set of issues that we're considering. Lastly, the economic statistics that we rely on to, to populate the economic models are, it, are likely to be somewhat unreliable uh, uh, right now. An example is the unemployment rate. So the unemployment rate in Vermont based on initial claims for unemployment insurance is almost certainly north of 20%. Uh, we've seen continuing claims above 70,000 in, in the state. But the actual unemployment estimate will come via a survey that's done in April. And this survey depends on uh, a, a, a response rate that in part is stimulated by uh, uh, follow-up actions, uh, everything from you know lots of calls and and such to knocking on doors. Well, the staff doing this isn't knocking on any doors right now. And so uh, uh, that will affect the, the, this particular metric and its accuracy. And then furthermore, BLS models those uh, results and the, uh, the data turns into the unemployment rate that we commonly look at. It's, it's there are six different unemployment rates. I think I've shown at different times to the committees all these different rates and how they vary, but, but U3 is the most common one. One of the questions in U3 is, are you looking for work? You have to be actually, you have to say, yes, I'm looking for work to be considered unemployed by that metric. A lot of people who have been laid off aren't looking for work. They're waiting for their job to come back, um, but they, you know, the reply may say they're not looking for work and therefore the unemployment number, the headline number may be much lower than what it really is. So there are things like that we have to take into account. The other thing is almost all economic data that we're using is backward looking. So, you know, we're, we're, we're getting statistics now uh, that, that relate to a month earlier or several weeks earlier. And we've been trying to develop more timely stats. We've been working with the tax department to get real-time feeds for key companies and key taxpayers that will help give us insights into particular industries. The loss of the meals and rooms and sales and use filings because of the deferrals um, 
uh, is a, a, a really clouds our ability to do uh, as much analysis as otherwise we could of these two critical sectors and, and tax sources. But we're still able to look at collections of, of taxpayers that are paying or are filing by paying uh, to, to get a clearer understanding. And we're doing that on a, on a weekly and sometimes daily basis. We were also working with the utilities in the state who've been really cooperative in providing uh, daily electricity consumption data by sector. And that's a useful window into what's really happening and where people are. So that'll be useful. That's been useful both to look at what kind of declines we've gotten, but also as, as we start to come out of this, uh, to what extent are we really emerging and, and which sectors and where uh, is, is there some resurgence? Um, we ran these numbers without the benefit of uh, month end tax data. And April's a critical month because it's the first month that will give us a window into this period in the second half of March when the, the shutdowns really started. And uh, so we'll have that data finalized uh, in a few days. And then we'll be able to go in and start doing these sorts by uh, individual company and groups of companies. Uh, we'll be grouping them by NAICS codes. That involves assigning a lot of companies NAICS codes because they're not all in the tax department data. There's a lot of legwork involved in that, but um, hopefully we'll be using some of these other stats to help us uh, uh, see into things more quickly because this has been incredibly rapidly moving and things have been changing um, uh, really quickly. But I think it's hard sometimes to understand this in typical economic terminology. It's not a traditional recession. It's a planned temporary shutdown and then there are gonna be lots and lots of knock-on economic effects from this. Um, the, the revenue estimates in the tax attached sheet uh, you know, that, that uh, Sorsha just put up and, and you all have as handouts, um, and there should be some notes that, that are with that um, as well, are, are, are best understood as order of magnitude type estimates. Uh, and uh, just to give you a sense of that, they're roughly triple for FY21 relative to the January forecast are roughly triple the losses of FY20. So it's not like this is just gonna be a steep second quarter drop and then things are gonna uh, bounce back. Uh, it will be much longer lived and, um, and, and, and uncertain pending what happens uh, epidemiologically. So um, there, are, uh, you know, there are a lot of things going on at a more detailed level. Uh, one of the hardest hit tax categories is meals and rooms, of course, that's uh, both affected near term by an almost complete cessation of activity and will be much slower in coming back. And then also a lot of, uh, spending on tourism and, and travel is done by older age cohorts. And that is a group that's most uh, affected by uh, 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 the uh, virus and, and probably will be the, the most fearful about uh, coming back. So that sector is likely to have more long lasting impacts into FY21 and beyond. Corporate tax too is something that can swing wildly uh, because it's based on, on profitability and people tend to pay ahead. So estimated tax payments are, are payments based on normal flows of business and business was really cooking leading up to this. So, you know, corporate receipts were looking very good. We even had a, an extraordinary payment in March, uh, which, which had to do with um, merger and acquisition activity. Um, which is the kind of thing you get when the economy is really doing well. Uh, but the flip side is corporate profitability is turned on a dime and, and the cash needs that corporations have are huge. So corporations are hoarding cash um, and not only will estimated payments drop, but we'll start to see uh, uh, probably some refunding and that could swing corporate revenues hard down. 
personal income tax is sort of uh, has lagged effects because it's what happens in calendar 20 that will be that will affect next April's uh, uh, collections. So uh, that also has uh, quite large fiscal 21 impacts. Um, so anyway, that's that's sort of where we're at with this. This is going to get refined, and and in a couple of weeks we will have a consensus version. Um, the administration wanted to have all of the April data in before they uh, uh, started in on it. And um, uh, it will be no later than May 15th, but hopefully a little bit earlier. If we can process that, we'll have a consensus version of the same. But we will be using the same macroeconomic uh, uh, data that was uh, purchased jointly um, uh, with Jeff Carr. So, um, I, you know, I think I order of magnitude, I don't expect it to be uh, radically different, but we'll, we'll be doing, you know, a lot of fine tuning to this. And even to FY20, we'll have better information when we fully, fully analyze April, April data. So I'll throw it up to questions uh, now. I think that's, that's sort of most of the overview. All right. Thank you, Tom. Oops, go ahead. I just want to make one comment. So as we go ahead with the budget adjustment for fiscal year 20, the data in front of us is consensus data. It, it's, right. it's fiscal year 21 that we will receive in, in mid-May. In mid that's right. Yep. Uh, Peter. Thank you. So the, um, and Tom, thank you. So the personal income tax data that you have on here for Q4 of FY20 shows a down of almost $177 million. Does that take into account what they anticipate they will receive on 15 July because it was pushed back from 15 April? No. So all of the FY20, you'll see on that sheet, it has the, there are separate columns for the, there are a separate column for the shift it's called. So it's, um, ah. Uh, FY uh, 20 to 21 shifts are called out, but the the uh, final numbers for FY 20 and 21 that are the farthest to the right uh, do not include those shifts because uh, right now the understanding is that the tax department will be able to uh, uh, count those in July when they come in and and count those as part of FY20, even though the counting will take place later. So they feel like they're, you know, they're comfortable being able to capture and identify and separate that revenue and move it back to FY20. So right now we're assuming that that will get cleaned up for cash flow purposes. Uh, we call it out there and we do estimate it separately. So. Uh, those shifts are, are pretty substantial, as you can see. And, um, but, but the uh, final numbers, when I'm talking about FY20 and FY21, uh, uh, exclude the shifts. They're, all the revenue goes into the year that it was supposed to go into. And you can see uh, you know, a lot of those shifts are, are pretty, pretty large. But if you go all the way over to the uh, right-hand column in the, in the yellow thing where it says FY20 revenue, that's the revenue uh, excluding the shifts. Thank you. Uh, Chip. Then Emily. Uh, hi, Tom. Um, so you said that the um, leisure and hospitality uh, industry is they have a low um, use of the payment protection program relative to other sectors. Um, so I'll, I'll assume that that in part means that they just haven't applied for it. And if that's true, is do we know why? Uh, we, we don't have a, lo a lot of good information right now uh, that's statistical. Anecdotally, uh, smaller companies, and, and particularly in the restaurant component of that, the, the entities can be quite small. Um, the initial applications uh, were, were banks favored their larger customers and customers that had borrowed before. And the application process required going through a bank. And um, it, uh, a, a lot of the small, smallest businesses complained that they couldn't get a bank to process it. 
and uh, and they were left out of the first first round altogether. It's not a terribly complicated application, but there are some steps that um, uh, you know could could cause some uh, uh, difficulty or might be hard to understand uh, for some of the smallest businesses. So uh, I haven't seen statistics, uh, you know, that break that out further, but anecdotally, that's, that's what I've heard. The other thing that might be coming into play with this is that a lot of them shed their workers early on and they, uh, you know, they're concerned about taking out a loan, then rehiring the workers because most of the money has to be used for payroll. Uh, and then not being in a position in three months to really be back in business, not having enough demand to still support the business and then having payroll obligations and all the expenses of starting up. So I, I think there's, there've been a mix of things that, that have played into that. I also think that when there's a restart, some of the lowest paid workers will be better off being unemployed with the, with the extra money, the $600 uh, a week extra that's, that's provided through July 31st will be better off to remain unemployed until July 31st rather than coming back. And, there's, and the employees also have safety concerns. So I think there could be real issues about getting workers back into some of those establishments. Um, thank you. That all kind of rings true. Um, one other question. You said it's, um, we may have difficulty getting an accurate unemployment rate um, for the reasons you described. Um, are there, there are negative consequences to, to that if we, if we aren't able to get an accurate picture? Well, it, it just means for my purposes, I, you know, those are stats that we use in the economic models that we then estimate revenue impacts from. So in, in the case of the unemployment rate, if it comes in way too low, um, we'll use a proxy that we think is more accurate. So I think probably something like uh, a little bit above 16% is about the lowest that I think I would use, but we'll, we'll, we'll plug in some other number because we don't believe it. But it just is a lot of work to derive something that we think is you know, what the number should be. That said, I've, I've spoken at length of, about this with Matt Barowitz, who's the economist of, at the Department of Labor. And um, he said that state uh, BLS uh, uh, economists, which, you know, BLS is funding the, the, all the statistical work at the Department of Labor, uh, are, are all saying that, that, that BLS should be using the data without all the massaging that typically gets done to try to stabilize erratic data because the data aren't erratic because there's noise and, and collection problems primarily. They're erratic because there's this unprecedented event. So we'll see how they come out, but it, it just might mean that I have, that, that Jeff Carr and I would have to agree on numbers that we think are more realistic, plug them in and hopefully you know, the system catches up with it. Thank you. Uh, Emily? And I'm sorry, there's a printer going very close to my head. And so if it's as loud for you as it is for me, I'm sorry. Um, this is sort of an amateur question, but what is CHYA on the chart? Well, I'm sorry, uh, percent change year ago. Thank uh, you. Yeah, CH change Y a year ago, I'm sorry, yeah. Uh, are you, uh, Kitty, are you trying to? I, I did, I can't raise a hand. As a co-host, so Sorry. <laughs> I have to uh, raise you it. Just jump in. <laughs> I wanted to. I just wanted to go back to Chip's question, Tom, about the PPP program. I have a small um, machine supply company in St. Johnsbury who's reached out, and I've had some other in Vermont size. They're medium, but they're small compared to the rest of the world businesses who almost wish they. Well, at this point, they wish they hadn't even applied for the program because the guidance still is so murky and the clock is already ticking that if they have received the money, they have eight weeks to get it out, but their employees aren't back and employees don't want to come back and they don't know if they can meet the timeline and they don't, they don't want it as a loan. 
um, if their employees eventually come back and they feel they're going to be on the hook for money and even they've had lawyers look at it and lawyers are disagreeing on what it means and even lawyers at national levels for you know in industry at national levels are, are not agreeing and and they, they just feel the PPP program is really um, they're uncertain if they should be in it not knowing what the end result is going to be. Have you heard these these types of um, issues? Yes, ab absolutely. And they're making up the rules as they go. So there are a lot of open questions that haven't been determined. And so, you know, the even even as they were launching this, you know, it was announced at an interest rate of half a percent, and they just changed it to one percent. And you know, there, there's just a, a whole bunch of things that are really important components of it for people that might be getting it that are either changing or are ill-defined. So I don't know if they're going to end up being very generous with those kind of things, or if they're going to be, you know, strictly auditing stuff. It's hard to say. I went through the process on behalf of a nonprofit um, for, for which I, I uh, am on the board and. So I, I did the application uh, and, and so have that personal experience with it. And it, it was a head scratcher, um, you know, just to, you know, I, I mean, I know what the intent is. So I'm thinking, all right, they'll be reasonable about it. And, and you know, otherwise this entity is going to have to lay off people. It's a relatively small nonprofit, but they're about 20 employees. And uh, so it's... Um, uh, it, it, I, I can I can sympathize with the businesses that are trying to figure this out, and uh, and and the clock's ticking. We we were one of the first ones that had, so that Friday when the the door was supposed to be open, we tried to apply with Citizens Bank. They wouldn't even they they said they didn't get direction from Treasury that was adequate until uh, the following Tuesday. So four days later. Even then, the application took quite a while. It it was we signed documents last Friday, but there's still no money. George. Uh, yes, thank you, and Tom. Thank you for that presentation. But I also I wanted to go back to the the chart that we have and make sure I'm understanding it clearly. If we look at the second line, the total general fund, and I look to the far right, um, well, the 2020 consensus forecast is minus 4%. And then the best guess at 21 is minus 14%. That's an additional 14% on top of on top of that um, the the 4% for 2020, correct? That's correct. And then the only other the other question I had is, is just a curiosity, but why is the percent drop in the um, meals and rooms tax different for the Ed Fund and the General Fund? Uh, so it's about a percentage point different. Um, Is that just math that I'm... Well, I'm not sure if that's a rounding sort of thing. I mean, that's allocated by a formula. It's pretty close, but the formula shouldn't change between the years. I'm trying to think if there's any other small nuance that's going into that. That's all right. I don't need an answer now. It's just a curiosity. If... Yeah, I see that it's slightly different. Um, I'll 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 look into that. We could have to do with the with the uh, uh, exclusion of the shifts, but yeah, it's more or less an identity. So that should be. That percent change, I think, should be the same. I'll look at that. I'll look into that and see if that's an issue. Uh, Tom, I've got yeah. a couple of questions. Um, uh, one, um, if you can sort of help us understand how we compare to other states in terms of what's going on in with revenue, and the other question is. When you do a revenue forecast, you often uh, describe the risks um, and the risks being on the upside or the downside and maybe some idea of what those risks are and perhaps you could talk about that a little bit. Yeah. Um, 
I haven't seen a lot of other states revenue forecasts. The Federal Reserve uh, Bank in Boston shared some recently uh, uh, with the with the uh, six states that are are a part of of um, of that. Massachusetts had done three scenarios, and they varied by a factor of ten in terms of the revenue loss. So, you know, from half a billion to five billion. And so that just gives you an idea of, you know, that's sort of like saying, we don't know. Um, and fair enough, it's, it's, um, it, it is highly uncertain. None of the other states had uh, official forecasts out for FY21. Um, maybe one other did, but uh, they're, they're just starting to come out. And of course, they're gonna be based on models like the Moody's model and things like that. Um, uh, collectively, Moody's just, um, the, the credit rating part of Moody's came out with a, a, a report that was in the news this morning saying about $160 billion across all states. But two days earlier, the Moody's economics group, the analytics group that produces the, the macro models that we work with, uh, they said it would be more like 200, possibly as much as 300 billion across state governments. So it, even within the same entity, uh, there's, there's that much variation. We're looking at forecasts that are done by um, uh, some of the economists that participate in the Wall Street Journal surveys. There are about 75 economists with that and, and a handful of them are, are people I know personally. So um, we've gotten some forecasts from people there. They're all over the map. Um, you know, some have this being like a very short duration thing and it comes right back. Others say uh, the second quarter is not the worst. CBO just came out with a forecast that was saying the third quarter is really going to be worse than the second quarter, but, the, uh, but then it's improving. Others have a, a, a second wave. There are quite a few that have a, a third or fourth quarter 2020 blip back up, uh, you know, real another second wave uh, uh, infection and a second shutdown and things like that. Uh, so you just get very different scenarios uh, based on what what's out there. Um, in terms of risks, that it's not sort of the normal economic risks that you know would be saying, okay, there's an imbalance and that needs to be corrected in order for growth to resume. And then there are a lot of knock-on effects to that, but we know what the rebalancing needs to do. We knew what where housing prices needed to be in order to be back in balance after you know, the real estate crash that occurred. Um, there's, there's nothing like that going on the economy that's driving this. There, there are parts of the economy that were arguably out of balance or at risk. And they were those things that on that on that matrix of revenue risks in the last revenue forecast we had, you know, so the stock market was listed as something that, you know, was a vulnerability because it's arguably overvalued. Well, one of the first things that happens is it loses a lot of value. And corporate bonds, uh, uh, junk bonds, uh, corporate leverage is really, really high. And that's a, a real vulnerability that secondary effects can be problematic. So it, you know, it kind of anything that's vulnerable, it it lays bare. Um, but I but I think the risks are more the epidemiological risks that you all are aware as aware of as I am. I don't have any special insights into that. George, maybe you, you know, could could speak to that or or you know people that look at it. We're in touch with all the people doing these epidemiological models, um, but it's it's not like there's a lot of clarity going out. A year, two years. Um, Bob, help. I think you're muted. Uh, yeah. There you go. Am I on? Yeah. All right. Okay. All right. Um, yeah. C can I? And I hate to do this to you, but we were on the the uh, PPP program there a little while ago, and I just have a small question on that it 
I had a company apply and they did everything right. Went through the bank, da -da 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 -da, the whole thing and got it in right on time only to find out that small companies in the eyes of the federal government had bombarded them. Now in the eyes of the federal government, I believe a small company is up to 500 employees. It's, it's not small in Vermont size. But anyway, so all these guys, the little guys with 25 employees got, um, got lost on the whole thing. I have heard, this is my question now, I have heard that um, recently the federal government is going to um, put in another bunch of funds for that. And book a couple questions when is that true when will that be and will it be more targeted for what is in rural communities a true small business yeah so the second tranche of that was approved recently uh and um it's had some application startup problems uh that that were similar to the prior one with that, there was there were some carve outs of of uh, part of the additional money was to be allocated to underserved areas and to smaller banks, so that it would presumably get to uh, uh, just those 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 folks that you're talking about. It remains to be seen whether that is really the way it'll happen. Um, they've also been trying to limit the big banks from pushing through like hundreds of applications all at once. Uh, the bigger banks are just better set up to, you know, to do that. So they've been dominant to date. So anyway, that was the intent of the second round of it. I think it'll be very, it'll be fully sub subscribed very quickly. And whether any more money is available or not, I don't know. As I said, there are a lot of entities that are getting this that don't really have a need because you don't have to show damages to qualify. You just have to say there's uncertainty associated with the, you know, the, the, the pandemic. And so you're getting a lot of companies that are applying that, you know, maybe they'd have laid off, you know, one or two people, but not the whole staff. And then they get, you know, free payroll for two and a half months and some other expenses. And, you know, that's, that's just extra, extra profit, extra cushion. Um, but it's, it's not really a need based, it isn't targeted by need. So I think that's why it was so heavily utilized and, and accounting firms too. I don't know if any of you got the, but accounting firms shot out letters to their clients. And again, this is going to be, this is going to benefit bigger firms more than smaller firms saying, Go for it. This money's here. Here's all you have to do. Okay. All right. Doesn't sound good for the little guy. No, it hasn't been. Um, Thank you. Let's see if there are any other questions, George. And yeah, since I don't, since I don't see any other questions, um, the um, you know the the issue is with so much of the uncertainty around the future of this um, has to do with the uncertainty about whether we will have an effective vaccine and how hard it's been to find medications that actually treat the disease. Um, you know, there's some disconcerting information about people who have been infected, have had negative tests, and then seem infected again, um, which would say antibodies might not be um, as protective as we would hope. And, you know, various diseases have a real range of how, how uh, um, pr protective previous infection antibodies, antibodies are. Um, and, and so I think that's part of the big uncertainty with the epidemiological uh, projections that, um, you know, that, that, that's, that are out there. If we had, uh, if we do find a, a um, vaccination that, that works, um, 
then then uh, things will be very different. Um, and people, you know, people are working very hard, but there's still no guarantee we'll even ever have one that really, really works. And, and that just leads to so much uncertainty. And then there's the whole other behavioral piece, which it's pretty hard to predict from the epidemiology point of view. You know, will, will people continue to, to self-isolate? Will, will, you know, some of these states opening early cause a nationwide rebound? Um, it's, it's, there are just so many unknowns with something so new. Thanks, George. Thank uh, you. Uh, Marty? Thank you, Tom. I'm looking at the uh, two far right-hand corners, the, the right-hand columns, the FY20 revenue and the 21 revenue and the changes. And I find it curious that on the transportation fund, the 21 numbers are better than they were in 20, as opposed to the, all of the other categories where it continues to get worse. Um, are, are you presuming that people are going to be out driving again and and doing what? I'm not sure if they're not spending money, what are they doing out driving around? Well, well, they're, the, the, um, the lockdowns are presumed to uh, uh, end, but the, the return uh, back to work will, will be slow, but it's, um, uh, it will be happening. Uh, again, relative to these other, okay. uh, you're looking at it relative to the other uh, categories, I mean, you have a lot of lagged effects in the general fund. I talked about the corporate tax, but also personal income, which is just huge. And a lot of those effects um, are, are, are really calculated on calendar year activity. And when you look at calendar 2020, it's going to have all of the worst quarters, you know, as a part of that. So um, right. revenue risk there is really high. Um, but that's still... Um, yeah, uh, uh, you know, you're, you're not going to have a complete, uh, nowhere in this forecast is another complete shutdown of activity. And, and that's what really, you know, knocked out all the, all the gasoline usage and, and, uh, and the like. Um, you know, there's, there's still pronounced impacts, but they're not quite as severe. Right. Thank you. Okay. I just found that interesting that the <coughs> fund doesn't seem in such a bad shape. Yeah, it's all relative at this point. I think if you asked anybody in the transportation department, <laughs> they'd they'd be screaming. But it's uh, yeah, it's it again. It <laughs> it went down a lot in fiscal twenty two. So when you look at the two year sure. change, it's it's pronounced. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, because those figures are cumulative. Right. Um, it doesn't look like there's more questions, and we do want to keep some time uh, for Mark Pearl to talk about the education fund. So um, unless there's some last question, um, I think we'll thank you, Tom, uh, for the work you're doing. We know it's a tough uh, situation, but the fact that you're giving us some uh, guidance um, means that we can start doing some of the work that we've got to do, both on budget adjustment for house appropriations and for us in the education fund. So thank you. Great, you're welcome. Thank you, Tom. Katie, do you want to get Mark started? I think, I think it's. I think it would be great, Mark, if you are are ready to start. Um, both committees. I know you've done the overview uh, with the House Ways and Means Committee, and both Janet and I thought it would be helpful if appropriations heard it, and then uh, could share and listen to each other's questions. Um, we are hearing a lot about the education fund in our communities, and so this is a timely presentation. And uh, do you have um, you you have slides that you will put up, Mark? Yeah, yeah, I do. So okay. um, good. Good morning, Let's everybody. Um, so, Sorsha, do you um, uh, am I able to uh, share my own screen? Yes, you are. Okay, so I'm I'm going to pull up there. So let's see. Uh, And again, for committee, I think it would be best if, if Mark got through his presentation and then we do our questions at the end. We are on the floor at 1030 and I'm assuming people would like at least a 10 minute break before we go to the floor. So we have approximately a half an hour mark for this. Okay, 
That's great. Uh, Katie, uh, can I just ask, are we actually on the floor or are we doing, is this a caucus of the whole? I believe we're on the floor and I okay. think we have a couple of bills that we're moving today. Oh, okay. All right. Does anyone um, else want uh, to weigh in? Or yeah, according it? according to email from Bill McGill, the morning will be a caucus of the whole. Oh, right. thank you, thank uh, you. Are we are we then moving bills in the afternoon? I think so. Okay. Yes. Correct. Yeah. Thank you, George. Okay. Okay, so um, I, I plan to walk you through a couple balance sheets. There's a lot of information on here, so I'm going to point you to some specific lines on here. So there's a lot of information on here, but don't panic. I'll take you to the right lines. And I also wanted to point out that um, although House Ways and Means has been through this presentation at least once, um, the numbers have changed. So even in FY20, it's going to look a little bit different. And um, based on what um, Tom said earlier, um, my understanding is this is now a consensus forecast. So these numbers for FY20 are probably pretty good, even though they've moved around a bit. So what I what th this sheet has three columns on it. The first one right here for FY19 is just for reference. So what I'm going to focus on are the two columns here that are both FY20, okay? So the middle column, which is January for, in 2020, shows you where we were or where we thought we were going to end the current fiscal year prior to the outbreak um, of the coronavirus. So I'm going to take you down to show you that we were actually in pretty good shape um, prior to things going south a month ago. Um, if you look on line 30, you can see this $12.9 million. That's a surplus. That's on top of having a full reserve up here on line 26. So we had a full reserve, 36.4, which is a 5% reserve. And we had a $12.9 million surplus. So we thought we were pretty good, in pretty good shape going into 2020. And at some points we were talking about even potentially having a tax rate reduction. So if you now move over to the next column over, which is labeled um, FY 2020 COVID-19, um, first I will show you um, what happened to the numbers that Tom has just gone over. So sales and use lines three, four, five, and six are all non-property tax revenues that are forecasted by um, Tom Cavett and Jeff Kai. They're our consensus numbers. And you can see that the sales and use took the biggest hit, but we've also lost revenue in purchasing use, meals and rooms, and the lottery transfer. Collectively, that amounts to about a $54 million loss in non-property tax money. The impact of that is that if you go back down to these same lines, we've used up the $12.9 million surplus. We've used up the $36.4 million that was in the stabilization reserve. And we, were, we are still $4.5 million short. That's a deficit which will be carried forward into FY21, okay? Everybody with me? Yes? <laughs> okay, so there's two, two caveats to go along with this. Um, the first, and, and Tom mentioned these. The first is that um, businesses have been allowed to defer um, some sales and use tax revenue and some uh, meals and rooms tax revenue until, uh, this says June, but it's actually May 25th. Um, this balance sheet assumes that all of that money is remitted and that it's all remitted between now and uh, July 25th. 9th or 30th and that money will all be for accounting purposes all of that money will show up in 2020 but whether or not that money is actually remitted is still an open question the other caveat or the other caveat is that um the this assumes that all of the education property tax money that we're expecting to collect comes in for FY 2020, it's probably not a huge issue because most of the education property tax revenues that are due into the education fund this fiscal year have already been collected. But it's possible because some towns still have collection dates yet to come that they won't be able to collect some of that money. They are, however, required to remit it to the education fund. So for purposes right here, I'm assuming all that money comes in. So in some ways, this is a best case scenario. The last point I'll make is that there is $27 million um, in federal aid. It's from the uh, Elementary and Secondary Emergency Education Relief Fund that will be available um, for uh, supervisory unions. That money will go not through the education fund, but directly to the supervisory unions and then out to um, individual school districts. Um, my understanding is that AOE has still not received the guidance and the application materials they need in order to um, 
let districts know how much money that is. But you'll notice up on line 20, which is total uses, I haven't made any changes in there. So this, it's possible that there are some additional costs that districts are incurring in FY20, but there's also um, potential of this available aid coming through. So I've just left things as they are, but it's just, I'm pointing it out because it's, you know, even in 2020 with a consensus forecast, there's still some uncertainty here. So um, any questions on that part before I move on? Yeah, I, clear oh, okay. yeah. I had a clarification question. So the $54 million loss mm -hmm. uh, that, that we have to make up and that's that in, in, in to get to 54, we're using our 5% reserves and the entire 20 or 13 million of surplus. Yes. 13, okay, 13. The 23 million that's coming in for aid, mm -hmm. Decides, who decides if that is used to apply to the 54 or if it's for other expenses districts have incurred? How, who decides how that money is used? Um, I don't know. The, 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 the feds will make the payment to the agency of education and the agency of education then has to uh, allocate that money to supervisory unions based on the Title I formula. So we really have no say on where it goes or how much money it is. Um, and because AOE doesn't have any guidance, I don't, I can't really answer that question. I don't know how that money would be used. It may be that it just bypasses the education fund entirely and shows up in um, school, in, you know, on school balance sheets. And they have that money available to cover COVID-19 COVID related costs they incur either in FY20 or in FY21. But it's an open question at this point. Uh, AOE just doesn't have any guidance on that no, money. But Mark, um, yeah. I'm not recommending we do this necessarily, but if, if the legislature, if we decided that that money should be netted against uh, the payments that were going to go out to schools, the legislature would have to make that decision. Am I right about that? Um, I, I I don't know the answer to that question. Normally, um, if a district, if you're talking FY21, normally if a district receives yeah. federal aid, that federal aid shows up as an offsetting revenue, so it's subtracted from their budget before they get to education spending. Oh, so it could. Okay. But whether it can be used for that, whether it's going to be accounted for that way, I don't know at this point. Okay. Okay. So the agency may may have a maybe maybe making that decision on their own. Um, George, um, Mark, um, thank you for the presentation. You you did say that the numbers were different than the last time you presented this to the Ways and Means Committee, mm -hmm. um, but I'm wondering if you could show me where those differences are. Okay, up, up here on lines, um, right here, these, these lines right here. Um, initially, the downgrade was about $89 million, and now it's about- oh, Mark, Mark I'm, I'm not looking at the screen that um, Torsha oh. has up. I, I'm looking at the document from the email. So rather than saying just here, can you tell me what line it is? Sure, lines three, four, five, and six in the most right-hand column. The difference between what we thought we were going to have in January and what we think now on this sheet is $54 million. Previously in House Ways and Means, I showed you a sheet that had an $89 million drop there. So it was a much, you know, this is a better, this is a much better sheet than you looked at earlier because the deficit that we're carrying forward from 20 to 21 now looks like it'll be about four and a half million. And at one point it was 39 and a half. So that, that's where the difference is. And that's why I wanted to go over this again with you because the, the numbers changed quite a bit for that year. But again, this, is, this, this should be consensus at this point. 21 is gonna be a different story. Those numbers are gonna be still moving targets for a while, but um, I think we're pretty much getting pretty close to what we think we're gonna have in 2020. So, so we Mark, shall be happy. I uh, know. <laughs> um, <laughs> less, um, less unhappy. Less unhappy. Um, could you, uh, um, uh, be very clear about what it is we carry from fiscal 20 to 21. Um, sure. We have a deficit, we have a reserve, but yeah. go through the list, or maybe you're doing that later. No, I can tell you right now, I mean, it's, it's a really good point because it, it gets lost when you're sort of looking at this. The yeah. four and a half million dollar deficit is only a small part of a big story because we're also going to go into 21 with no stabilization reserve, zero in there. So if you're really looking at what the, what the problem is, it's the um, it's the, um, the 36 and a half. And actually by next year, that number grow, there was stabilization reserve would go to 38 million. And I'll show you that on the next sheet. But that 38 million plus the four and a half million dollar deficit is money that has to be made up just to get to 
ground level next year, just to get to zero next year. So four and a half plus 38. Yeah. Uh, plus whatever budgets have been voted. What what it, what is the problem we have to solve in 21? Okay, I'll, I'll go to the next balance sheet. I have a 21 sheet. Oh, okay. You You're going to get there. Okay. Uh, Mary, go ahead. I think you're muted, Mary. Sorry about that. I pushed it a bunch of times. Um, how l good is the assumption that the 20 million in sales and use and rooms and meals will be collected and able to be added to 20, the FY20 numbers? Um, I, yeah, I don't have any really real way of answering that um, other than point to point out it, until it's collected, it's a risk. But, um, I, you know, I don't know. I, all I can tell you is we're assuming all that money will be collected to the extent it's not that problem, that deficit, that four and a half million dollar deficit will get larger. So I appreciate that we're making that assumption. It strikes me that there's a high likelihood that some portion of that will not be collected. And, but I agree. Are we thinking half, a quarter, a tenth? Or is it just too wild to speculate? I have, I have no idea. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Okay, so um, Sorsha, if I'm going to move on to a next page uh, uh, or another sheet, how do I do that? Do I just. I, I would stop the share of the screen, move on to your next document, then reshare. Okay, let me see. Uh... Uh-oh. <laughs> Red letters at the top, Mark. Stop share. Stop share. Stop share. Got that. Okay. Share the screen. And then we're going to look at this one. Okay. Can everybody see this one? Yep. Okay. So on, there's, there's three more columns on this sheet. The FY 2020 sheet is this uh, right here on the left-hand column. This, again, just for reference, it's the, it's the column we were just looking at in the prior sheet. And what I'm showing you for FY 21 are two different scenarios. And so I'm going to focus on the, the middle one first. And what the middle column reflects is um, the updated revenue forecast um, that is not consensus at this point at current law. And it's to show you if nothing happened, if we didn't find any other source of money, if things just went ahead as normal, what would be the impact on tax rates next year? And so, um, let's say I haven't been through this one before, so let's be fair with it's here. awful. <laughs> yes, no, it's, it's, it's really awful. So yeah, what you can see, if you want to stick in, to, to cut to the chase, you can see up here, there is either a 22 or a 23 cent increase, whether you're homestead or non-homestead property. And that's in order to fill the um, non-property tax revenue gap in FY21 plus the deficit that's coming forward. Um, and I'll, I'll go over this on a separate sheet again in a minute. I just want to show you initially, but um, it, it's the, it's basically the total amount that we have to re-raise next year to make up for that lost non-property tax revenue money and the problems we have coming forward from 21, I mean from 20, including having to fill the reserve back up. So this run does assume that the, the reserve is full back up at 38%. Um, so if you drop down the bottom here, you can see we've got a $38 million reserve, which is the full 5%. Five, 5 and, um, and obviously no surplus since we're having to raise it. All of the money that needs to be raised on the property tax, it's the only other place to go. Again, this assumes that 100% of the property tax that is billed for is collected and comes in may be a much bigger problem in 21 than it is in 20 since none of that money has been collected yet. But these tax rate increases are quite dramatic. Um, okay. And then, you know, I have, I have a, um, an outline of, a, of a, a, a proposal that's been presented to House Ways and Means that I can walk you through. But before I jump off this sheet, um, I just want to show you, um, it'll, it'll be help, helpful for me to, to go through this last column here before I get to the next sheet and show you what's going on. So. On the right-hand column, what we've assumed is that the tax rate parameters that were set back in December, um, the recommendations from the tax commissioner remain in place here. And those are the tax rates that 
school boards were looking at when they were planning their budgets and what voters were looking at when they approved those budgets. These are the tax rates. So in there, there's a built-in tax rate of about 4.8 cents and six cents for the homestead and the non-residential property. That does not get you anywhere near being able to fill, um, you know, to be able to bring down this tax rate or uh, that tax rate would be, <laughs> that, that's a 22 cent difference. So on this line right here shows you the increase in the tax rate that would be necessary to balance the fund and hold these tax rates at where taxpayers were expecting them to be back in, in January when they were preparing their budgets. So it's an additional 17.2 cents solely attributable to the loss of revenues as a result of the COVID-19 shutdown. Everybody so, Martin, so what you're what you're trying to do here is you're trying to separate out the tax rate that is sort of the underlying tax rate that was just needed to fund budget changes that got voted and yep. a tax rate that is directly related to the pandemic. That's right. So you, you could call you, you could call this the normal tax rate up in these three lines here. That would be the normal tax rate right. that people would have expected to get be, without the pandemic. Mm -hmm. As a result of the pandemic, you, if you break it out, it looks like there's another 17 cents, which, which would be a sort of a COVID-19 tax right. rate yep. in order to balance the fund, pay for schools next year, and, and you know end up down here with a full reserve. So. Um, maybe that's it's a good jumping off point. I can come back to the sheet, but it might be easier if we look at the, uh, the one page outline. I did. We have a question first, uh, Mark from Bob Helm. Yep. Bob, you have a question? I think you're. Was that Bob? Bob, you're, you need to unmute. Okay, there we go. That work? Better. Yeah. yeah. All right. Sorry. In that the schools have been closed for a, I don't know, month, maybe a month and a half, whatever they are, and will continue to be closed for the month of May. What isn't it? Wouldn't there be a cost savings someplace along the line? Um, you know, I, I don't have any information on individual um, district budgets, but what I can tell you is that um, most most education expenditures, about eighty percent of them, are due to um, salaries and benefits, and teachers are still are still being compensated and being paid. Um, teachers probably are, but how about assistants and janitorial? Yeah, there's got to yeah. be some savings. My understanding. Yeah, um, my my understanding is that um, schools are continuing to. The, the, I don't I don't think they've had substantial savings, but again, I, I can't speak to the to the details of it. I don't have individual information on individual budgets, but it, you know it's a good point, and that's why I pointed out here on line ten. I'm assuming, you know that oh, that's the source of the line. Sorry, down here that the uses haven't changed under either of those, you know, under either scenario. And going well, it, it just seems to me there should be a savings, although I'm not going to be a bit surprised if there isn't. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Uh, again, I'm I was going to say that 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 is something uh, our committee's taken a very small amount of testimony on that. And I know the House Education Committee has taken quite a lot more. Um, and it, it, it'd be if there, I think it'd be important at some point for. Um, everybody in the house to understand sort of what the additional uh, pressures are on schools, and and I think uh, it's I think some of them maybe have had some savings. Um, a lot of them have actually spent more money. Right. Could be. Janet, I have a quick question just for clarification. The uh, under the the far right column on line D, the, mm -hmm. the seventeen the seventeen cent increase due to COVID related impacts what does that equate to in dollars is that the 149 million yes yes it is the 149 million yeah thank you yeah and, and again that that that's assuming that the the there's a 
a uniform increase, 17 cents across property. So in other words, it, it's not a rent tax rate that varies with education spending mm -hmm. the way right. the homestead tax does. But yes, right. yes, that's what that and, is. And does that include refilling the stabilization reserve? Yes. Okay. But again, what it doesn't count for is the two thirds of revenues that come into the education fund are property tax monies. And this assumes that 100% of that money is going to come into the fund. Okay. Uh, okay. Under, well, and I, I want to be clear to the world that this is not a proposal. We're not proposing to raise uh, education property tax rates by 17 cents. What Mark has done here is he wants to have us understand what would happen if we don't find another source of revenue. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And, and right. So the, the, the middle column shows you what happens if you do nothing. The mm -hmm. right-hand column breaks these two out, so you may be able to address each one differently. And that's what I'll get into in a single sheet now. If I, go. I also want to be clear that we haven't found another source of revenue, but no. um, so it's, this, is, this, this is the problem that we're looking at. Um, and the way the, fund, the way the education system works is that it will end up with property taxpayers if we don't um, find another solution. And, and for the appropriations committee, it was really important to, to understand the ed fund, but we will do the same exercises with the T fund and with the general fund yeah. so that you, you know, we will see the, the problems in all three of our major funds. Okay, so, so the sheet that I just put up, um, it's labeled a preliminary analysis of, of a proposal to finance education spending next year. It's very preliminary. I would call it more of an outline and an idea that I can walk you through but I, I, I think that it will help you get your head around what we were looking at in that right-hand column. So um, first, you had to add up the total increase in the education property tax that's necessary to, to, to finance voter-approved spending in both 20 and 21. And so what those are, we, I, we've already gone over these, but I'll just reiterate, four and a half million dollars to cover the projected 2020 deficit, 38 million to fully restore the stabilization reserve, in, in 21, the following year, 72 million to fully fund voter approved increase in school budgets. Those are already been approved. Those are budgets that were you know, approved during town meeting week. There's a few stragglers out there, but that number is not gonna change significantly. And then the $113 million revenue shortfall in non-property taxes that um, Tom just went over. Mm -hmm. So all of that money needs to be made up. It's a huge, huge amount of money, <laughs> more than I've ever seen doing this for ages. But um, that's that's the problem we're coming up with. So how to address the problem. So starting with two, as I pointed out in the earlier sheet, you can set, you can maintain what, what I've called on here, the normal education property tax rates for 21, which are the ones that we were expecting um, voters to have to deal with and what they voted for. And those would raise the average homestead tax rate by four and a half cents the non-homestead tax rate by six cents and the average tax rate on household income by about a 0.8 tenths of a percent. That doesn't get us anywhere near closing the gap that I've labeled, that I've put laid, laid forth in one, but it gets you part of the way there. <laughs> and it's what people were expecting to pay before any of this happened. Mm -hmm. Step three would be then just determine the additional increase in the education property tax that's necessary solely attributable to the impact of the COVID related recession. And that is the money that I was showing you on that line at 17.2 cents and the $149 million that would be needed. How would how that gap be filled? You don't want ta taxpayers seeing a 22 cent increase on their tax rates in, in the current environment would be extremely difficult, unprecedented. And so what this proposal is suggesting is that through some other source of money, taxpayers get money in their hands so that they can pay their property tax bills next year. And it's, it's quite a bit of money, but one suggestion has been to use a portion of the one and a quarter billion dollars from the Federal CARES Act to offset the increase in education property taxes that's attributable solely to COVID-19 through a flat credit per parcel of taxable property or some other mechanism of back to taxpayers. That would have a, a number of advantages. We've had there's there's been bills around about delaying payment dates and um, you know pushing back penalties and doing all that kind of stuff. Those kind of solutions to the problem create all kinds of chaos going through the system because it's it's like a domino system where the municipalities collect the money. If they don't collect the money, they don't have it. If they don't have to pay it to the state on time, it just pushes the problem off to the school districts and when they have to borrow. So there's all kinds of complications that get raised if 
you if you if you try to address this by say just you know dumping money into the ed fund or something like that this would put money into the hands of taxpayers so that they can pay their bills on time municipalities would be able to raise and remit that money without having to worry about hitting penalties or anything like that so um, this this approach if the money was found is a lot more elegant than anything else that we've been looking at so far I think because it wouldn't require a lot of disruption to the existing system that we have. It, has, so, it does have the problem that we don't have any money to do it, though. Right. That's right. <laughs> so in terms of having any money, I've heard that, um, there is supposed to be money for state and local governments in the next stimulus package that comes through. And that's already not happened once. So, you know, it's, it's fancy. Um, the other possibility is that there's more flexibility allowed for the CARES Act money that we already have. And the third possibility, and it's the only other one I can think of, is that the state would borrow, you know, 150 to 250 million dollars, and um, use that money to assist taxpayers in paying their bills in FY21, and that paid um, through the education fund over, you know, 10, 15 years, or however long you wanted to borrow. Um, I looked at some preliminary preliminary numbers um, of basically paying back over a 10 year period. Um, and if you were to borrow like 250, it would add like about three cents to the tax rate every year for about 10 years. So um, uh, no, Scott, but, has a, Scott Beck has a question. Hey, Mark. So I'm looking at number five here. Yes. Does that really mean we would give a flat credit regardless of what the, the property tax liability is for the parcel? One, one version of this, yes, but there's there's a number of, you know, there's any number of ways that you might want to do this. But um, we initially looked at a, a flat credit that would go out um, based on each parcel of property. And you're right, um, that would provide some more money than the, than the increase for some people and a little less for others. But um, at, I think we looked at it at, at $275 million, it would basically provide... Um, taxpayers with house sites up to a half a million dollars with, uh, with full, full coverage of their tax increase next year. People in house sites yeah. value over half a million, we pay, we pay a little bit more. So, Scott, uh, th so this, is, this is something our committee will, will yeah, spend right. some time on, but the, the thought about doing a flat credit is partly just the simplicity of it, because if we want to get money, if we want to put money on people's tax bills, um, we can't have a it can't be a very complicated system um, just in uh, order to be able to make it happen. Yeah, I, I just said the, the property tax liability is very wildly around. Exactly. This yeah, this um, would be uh, beneficial for people at lower income levels and lower property ba values. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you could just dump the money in and support the yields and the non res rate. It would all if come we, out. Of them. Yeah. If we could do that, that's what we do. Yeah. Yeah, right. right, and but there there is a complication doing it that way, which is you kind you kind of mess up the property tax adjustment calculation. But we may be able to work around that. But that that reminds me of one other thing I forgot to mention, and that is um, in FY twenty one, people who receive a property tax adjustment, which are about about seventy percent of homeowners, are going to receive a property tax adjustment that's based on their calendar year two thousand eleven income. So it's not going to reflect any of the repercussions of. Um, COVID-19 job losses and business closures and you know reduced revenues it's not going to show that those taxpayers will see that money in 20 in their in their property tax credit in 22 but they probably have more need for it right now and it's not it's not going to be a number that's any bigger than it would have been in the absence of the but we don't we don't understand the income loss or gain by decile right now um right I mean, it, there are people that are going to make money on this. There, there are. And, you know, the, the other thing that works against that is um, unemployment benefits. Um, and I'm assuming um, the payments that are coming from the feds are probably counted in household income. So incomes may right. not drop, drop quite as precipitously as you would think otherwise. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Jim, Nazan. You have to unmute. Oh, you did. Sorry. Okay. Oh, here we go. Income sensitivity. Payment would be based on FY11 income? Yes, calendar, yeah, 11 income, yes. Not 11. That's a long time ago. Oh, geez, I, I like, <laughs> sorry. Um, 2019, the prior. We need, we need you in this decade. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I've been doing it too long. Thank you. I'm all set now. Uh, Chip. <laughs> 
Um, Mark, number, um, well, the last line there, I'm looking at a different paper, but um, the last line there says that, um, that using the, the CARES Act money in this way would be problematic. I assume that's because um, they, the general guidance is that we can't use it to offset revenue losses. Is that, is that true? That's right. And so, um, well, you've just pointed out that the, um, you know, that 80% roughly is salary and benefits. So it would be a drop in the bucket, but is there under the present guidance, as we understand it, could, could we legitimately use it to offset, um, you know, the small costs of running buses to deliver the, the lunches that are being delivered, um, you know, maybe the paying the, the food um, staff, you know, other things like that, that we might argue are specifically COVID related? Yeah, and I, I think that the, the $27 million I mentioned, which is in the emergency, uh, elementary and secondary emergency fund, which was like that $27 million, that, that money can definitely be used for that for those purposes. So there may be sufficient funds there to deal with that issue. Um, at least in the current fiscal year. And um, as far as um, what else um, the uh, CRF money can be used for, I mean, I, I think that the, the guidance is not crystal clear. I think nobody's really, it's a legal question. I don't think I've got a clear answer yet on that. Um, so I have one more question and I, I'll put the caveat out there that this is not a proposal as well, but I'm just curious, do we, you know, has there been any calculation to sort of look at what would it take for reduction in spending by districts in order to meet the, the in order to balance the ed fund, right? So, you know, would it take a, on average, a, some percent reduction in, in spending by every district in order to make the ed fund balance under the present um, scenarios or, do we know what a 1% reduction by every school district would amount to oh, in terms yeah. of uh, spending? So we haven't done that yet, but it will be easy enough to go ahead and do it. But there's a couple problems. For, one is that uh, FY21 um, budgets have already been approved by voters. Right. And more probably more important, teachers contracts are being closed and settled now. So because 80% or almost 80% of school spending is attributable to salaries and benefits. Once you're locked into a teacher's contract, your FY21, once you can't lay off anybody and once the salaries and benefits are locked in, school districts would only have basically 20% of their budget to play with in order to create any savings. And it's for things that they may not be able to have much control over like transportation and heating and, um, you know, support staff, things like that. So it's, um, I'm not sure for FY21, if that's a possibility, it could be, certainly could be for 22. And we're looking, you know, we haven't gotten to 22 yet, but it's possible 22 is not gonna look great either. So um, uh, that's a that, fair does point. that answer your question? In about the way I expected it would be answered, but uh, yeah, okay. thanks. We are closing in on uh, we are closing in on 10:30 when we really should be on the floor. Marty has a question. Can um, and and this conversation will continue. This was just to, to to put the information on the table and and as Ways and Means works through it and as we hear more testimony in our committee, um, we we have many many more questions to be answered. Um, but let's take Marty's and and then I think to be respectful of the floor time, uh, we need to. Um, uh, adjourn this meeting. Is that agreeable, Jen? Okay, Jen, just yeah. to go ahead. I just follow up on on Chip's comments that what does it take to reduce spending? And I understand the argument we've heard that teachers' contracts are already signed. But the fact of the matter is, we don't have any money. And so, what would be the consequences of breaking those contracts, of reducing staff anyway? And and this is just a question to think about because I don't know the answers at all, but I'm wondering what we would have to do in order to reduce staffing in order to meet the budgets or in order to meet the income that we have. And I think we need to explore that and figure out if there are possibilities of actually doing that. But I, I can ask Abby Shepard that question. It's really a legal question. Um, my understanding is you can't break contracts, but um, right. I'll leave it to the lawyers to, to figure that out. The last point I wanted to make and I know you had to go is that 
Um, unlike the T fund and the general fund, the Ed fund is a little bit different because the lead time is so much greater. I mean, we need, you know, you need to set tax rates before you leave. So, you know, if we, if you were to get a consensus budget in August, it's going to be too late to factor in here. Decisions about tax rates probably need to be set, you know, within the next month or so um, in order for the, all the machinery to, to operate. And at that point, I think Tom mentioned that there may be a consensus number available um, by the middle of May, which would be okay. But um, we don't have a consensus forecast at this point. And setting the tax rates is something that um, really needs to get done before you guys leave. So. Thank you, Mark. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you, um, everybody, for uh, listening to the sort of the rollout of what the challenges are. Um, and so we'll, we'll adjourn and then go on the floor. And for my committee, we are meeting tomorrow morning. I can't remember what time, but we will uh, take this up again. And for House Appropriations, we're meeting tomorrow at 3 o'clock until 4.30 to start outlining the process for the budget adjustment. <laughs>